this year. Second, growth in the economy looks to be picking up. We expect GDP growth to be solid this year and to strengthen further in 2025. And third, as we consider how much longer to hold the policy rate at the current level, we're looking for evidence that the recent further easing in underlying inflation will be sustained. On a trois grands messages ce matin. Premièrement, la politique monétaire fonctionne. First, monetary policy is working. Total consumer price index and core inflation have eased further in recent months. And we expect inflation to continue to move closer to the 2% target this year. Second, growth in the economy looks to be picking up. We expect GDP growth to be solid this year and to strengthen further in 2025. Third, as we consider how much longer to hold the policy rate at the current level, we're looking for evidence that the recent further easing and in underlying inflation will be sustained. So before taking your questions, let me take a moment to discuss how the economy is evolving. We've revised up our outlook for global growth. U.S. economic growth again exceeded our expectations. And while growth is expected to slow later this year, economic activity is stronger than previously forecast. In Canada, growth stalled in the second half of last year, and the economy moved into excess supply. The labor market also cooled from very overheated levels. With employment growing more slowly than the working age population, the unemployment rate has risen gradually over the last year to 6.1% in March. There are some signs that wage pressures are beginning to ease. Economic growth is forecast to strengthen in 2024. Strong population growth is increasing consumer demand, as well as the supply of workers, and spending by households is forecast to recover through the year. Spending by governments also contributes to growth, and U.S. strength supports Canadian exports. Overall, we forecast GDP growth in Canada of 1.5% this year and about 2% in 2025 and 2026. The strengthening economy will gradually absorb excess supply through 2025 and into 2026. CPI inflation eased to 2.8% in February, and price increases are now slowing across most major categories. Inflation rates for durable goods, clothing, food, and services, such as recreation and travel, have all declined. However, shelter cost inflation is still high and remains the biggest contributor to overall inflation. Some other services, like restaurant meals, also remain persistently high. Looking ahead, we expect core inflation to continue to ease gradually. The more timely three-month rates of core inflation fell below 3% in February, suggesting some downward momentum. But with gasoline prices rising, CPI inflation is likely to remain around 3% in coming months. It's then expected to ease below 2.5% in the second half of this year and reach the 2% target in 2025. As always, there are risks around our forecast. Inflation could be higher if global tensions escalate and this boosts energy prices and further disrupts international shipping. House prices in Canada could rise faster than expected. And wage growth could remain high relative to productivity. On the downside, economic activity globally and in Canada could be weaker than expected, cooling demand and inflation too much. We don't want to leave monetary policy this restrictive for longer than we need to. But if we lower our policy rate too early or cut too fast, we could jeopardize the progress we've made bringing inflation down. So based on our forecast and these risks, Governing Council decided it was appropriate to maintain the policy rate at 5%. Dans l'ensemble, les données depuis janvier ont dit that overall, the data since January have increased our confidence that inflation will continue to come down gradually, even as economic activity strengthens. 
Our key indicators of inflation have all moved in the right direction, and recent data point to a pickup in economic growth. I realize that what most Canadians want to know is when we will lower our policy interest rate. What do we need to see to be convinced it's time to cut? The short answer is we are seeing what we need to see, but we need to see it for longer to be confident that progress toward price stability will be sustained. The further decline we've seen in core inflation is very recent. We need to be assured this is not just a temporary dip. The Governing Council also concluded that overall the data since January have increased our confidence that inflation will continue to come down gradually even as economic activity strengthens. Our key indicators of inflation have all moved in the right direction and recent data point to a pickup in economic growth. Now I realize that what most Canadians want to know is when are we going to lower our policy rate? What do we need to see to be convinced to cut? The short answer is we are seeing what we need to see, but we need to see it for longer to be confident that the progress towards price stability will be sustained. The further decline we've seen in inflation is very recent. We need to be assured it's not just a temporary dip. In the months ahead, we will be closely watching the evolution of core inflation. And we will remain focused on the balance between demand and supply in the economy, inflation expectations, wage growth, and corporate pricing behavior as indicators of where inflation is headed. To conclude, we've come a long way in the fight against inflation, and recent progress is encouraging. We want to see this progress sustained. And with that summary, the Senior Deputy Governor and I would be very pleased to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Governor. Let me just uh, quickly go over the ground rules. Um, as usual, we'll start with the reporters uh, we have here in Ottawa at the bank. Um, I'll ask you to everybody to please limit yourself to one question to maximize our chances of getting to every media outlet. After we go through the room, I will then uh, turn to the phones. If I forget to do so, please state your name and affiliation. Avant de poser une question, voulez-vous identifier si je l'ai passé? If I haven't done so, and as usual, you can ask your question, the official language of your choice. The first question is going to go to Annalise of the Canadian Press. Morning. Uh, is the door open to a rate cut in June? Is that in the, within the realm of possibilities for you? Um, yes, it's within the realm of possibilities. Um, look, I, I think we've been pretty clear. It, we, ha we are encouraged by what we've seen since January. If you look at our indicators, they're not all progressing at the same speed, but they, they're all, they've all been moving in the right direction. Uh, inflation's come down, uh, core inflation's come down. The more timely three-month measures of core inflation suggests there's downward momentum. Yes, shelter price inflation is still high. There are certainly some things that are still supporting inflation, but things are moving in the right direction. Uh, we're encouraged by that progress. Um, we, need to, we need to see that progress continue. Uh, and you know, if things evolve broadly in line with the outlook that we published today, we will be becoming more confident that we're clearly on a path to 2% inflation and it will be appropriate to cut our interest rate. Okay, next we'll turn to uh, Pramit Mukherjee from uh, Thomson Reuters. Thank you. Uh, just to continue on Najud's question, I mean, between now and uh, June, you will have two sets of data on uh, the labor market, on CPI, and uh, on GDP. Do you think those data will, be, and if it continues in the same direction, do you think that data will be sufficient, will give you sufficient evidence and confidence to actually go ahead for a rate cut in June? <laughs> Um, okay, well, let me expand. Let, let me take you through a bit more systematically um, what we've seen since January and what we're looking for in the next several months. So 
as I mentioned, if you look across our key indicators of inflation, we have seen progress uh, across those indicators. Some have made more progress than others, but they're all moving in the right direction. So let's just walk through them. The economy in the second half of last year, growth was close to zero. Economy uh, that allowed supply to catch up with demand. In fact, it's more than caught up the economies in excess supply. If you look at businesses' short-term expectations of inflation expectations, they've come down. They're running around 3%. If you look at corporate pricing behavior, it's continuing to normalize. There's a pretty detailed box three that looks at this at a very micro data. Uh, we also ask companies what they're planning to do, and you know, fewer companies are planning unusually large or frequent price increases. Um, if you look at households, their perceptions of inflation are coming down. You know, their short-term expectations of inflation have been pretty slow to come down. Um, but they are moving in the right direction. Uh, in the labor market, you know, it was very overheated. It has cooled. We're starting to see some evidence that wage growth is uh, easing. If you look at inflation itself, in the last couple of months, it's come down. Core inflation has was running around three and a half. It's now just over three. Again, if you look at the more timely three-month measures of core, um, they're now running below the 12-month the measures, suggesting there is some downward momentum. If you look at the, you know, our diffusion indexes, if you look at the how broad-based inflation is, it, it's less widespread. So those things are all moving in the right direction. We're encouraged by this progress, and we want to see that sustained. What is on our mind is that the, decli the, the decline we've seen in momentum is very recent. Wage growth has only uh, just started easing. Uh, inflation expectations uh, for households are only coming down very slowly. So, you know, to summarize, I went through the broad range of indicators to really highlight these are the range of things we're looking at. It's not one data point. It's not one number. It's, you know, all this evidence come the, coming together. And the message is, look, we are seeing what we, what we hoped uh, and we need to see. Um, we just need to see it for longer to be confident that we are clearly on a path to 2% inflation. And when we are when we are at that point, it will be appropriate to reduce our interest rate. Okay, I'm going to go to Jordan Gowling from CTV next, please. Hi, uh, I just want to ask you a bit about the rebound in business investment in Canada in 2024. Uh, what's accounting for that? Do you just see that as a blip, or you know, beginning of a sustained path of investment and uh, more confidence in the Canadian economy? Uh, Business investment through the second half of last year was was really quite weak. Um, we, you know, if you look at, for example, Statistics Canada's survey of what companies are planning in terms of their capex, uh, they are certainly planning more. We do think that's going to take a bit of time to materialize. So. Um, through the first half of the year, we don't think it'll be that strong, but we do think uh, it will be picking up. Overall, uh, you know, if you look at our growth profile for this year, um, you know, if you look at quarter by quarter GDP growth, roughly about two percent in each quarter, that gives you an annual average of 1.5. If you look at it on a per capita basis, what you see is it starts pretty weak, and as you get further into the year. Um, on a per capita basis, it's picking up. So what, what that means is that, um, you know, per household, households start to spend more over the course of the year. Uh, companies invest when they're more confident that, you know, that investment is going to yield a good return on them. So they're, they, they want to be assured the demand is there. So over the course of the year, we think that will start to become more apparent. All right, let's go to Mark Rendell of the Globe and Mail, please. Thanks for taking my question. Um, the growth forecast for both Q1 of this year and for the full year have been upgraded significantly. It seems like a lot of that is being driven by population growth, but I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit more on what's driving that growth upgrade, how much of it is that population growth picture versus other factors, and if you can kind of unpack a little bit, little bit of that. Yeah. Um, 
You're right, Mark, that the, the main factor is population growth, particularly in the first half of the year. Uh, we have revised up our, our estimate of population growth uh, in the first half of the year. Um, as you get later in the year and into 2025, we've actually revised it down because the government has um, uh, announced caps on uh, temporary foreign workers or non-permanent residents, sorry, um, which will pull it down. Um, but in the near term, it is higher, and so you got you got more households, more consumers. Uh, that adds to that adds to demand. That adds to growth. Um, there are some in the very near term. There are some special factors that are are boosting growth in the first quarter of this year. There was a public sector strike in Quebec uh, at the end of last year. That ended. That will provide kind of a a mechanical boost to growth in Q1. There were also a number of other events in the second half of last year, things like the forest fires we all remember. Um, so, you know, just the unwinding of those will boost the first quarter. But you're right, the, the main thing is um, working age population is growing faster, there's more consumers, there's more workers. As you get to the second half of the year, population growth starts to slow, but uh, consumption per household starts to pick up. Uh, so that when you look at growth on a quarterly basis through the year, we do expect some choppiness in the quarter over the, you know, the quarters, but if you average them, they average about 2% a quarter. Thank you for that. Let's go to uh, Greg Quinn from Market News, please. Good morning. Uh, I was wondering about the slight increase to the estimate of the neutral interest rate. Um, is that any kind of barrier to how far, or how fast you can cut interest rates? In other words, is it any kind of a hard floor or a squishy placemat? Um, Greg, what, what I would emphasize is that, first of all, the neutral rate is not something we can observe directly, and there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about it. We do estimate it, and it's a necessary input in our models, but it's not something that really has a much of influence on to real-time monetary policy. I mean, in real time, we're much more focused on where's inflation headed, uh, you know, what do we need to do to get inflation back to the 2% target? What do we need to do to maintain it? I mean, the neutral rate is, you know, it, it's a theoretical concept. It's, it's, you want to think about it. The neutral rate is where our policy rate would be in the long run when inflation's at target, the output gap is closed and there are no shocks. Well, of course, we'll never, we'll never actually get there. there. You know, in your forecast in the future, there's no shocks because you can't forecast shocks. But of course, when we get to the future, there will be shocks. So yes, it's something we need in our models. And you know, in, in, being, in being fully transparent, we, we, we publish the core assumptions underlying our models. That's one of them. We revise it once a year. And you know, with, with our estimate of U.S. Uh, neutral rate going up um, uh, and with, you know, some other factors, uh, we have revised up our neutral rate by 25 basis points. It's a range. The range moved up 25 basis points. Is that having a very big impact on, on you know, our deliberations in real time? No. Okay, let's go to Mackenzie Gray from Global News next, please. Uh, hi there. Uh, in the NPR, the main upside risk sections uh, for uh, inflation, the number one thing, or at least the first bullet point, was uh, house prices could rise sharply. Can you just kind of take us through the assumption on that? And when it comes to deliberations on potential increased uh, interest rate moves, how much consideration is put into what will happen within the housing market? Well, as you as you point out, we list it as one of the risks. Um, certainly, you know we do expect some pickup in house prices, as long as the uh, the demand for housing outstrips supply. There'll always be the potential for upward pressure on on housing prices. So, we have forecast some increase. Um, what we what we outline in the risk section is that increase could be more than we anticipate, and if that were to happen, um, that could put sort of pressure on overall inflation. 
Um, but what I would stress is, uh, you know, it's one of the things that we take into account when we make a policy decision. It doesn't rest on any, our, our decisions don't rest on any one indicators. The governor's outline, we think about a lot of things. Um, and we outline more than one risk. So uh, it's there. It's, it's one of the risks. It's not the only one. Okay, next I'm going to go to uh, Kevin Carmichael from The Logic, please. This report and much else that we're seeing. I think you need to put your mic on, Kevin. It is on. Do you not hear me? Oh. You project. Do you want me to <laughs> project? <laughs> Get on my, stand on my chair, too. Um, question about U.S. productivity, the U.S. productivity boom. Those numbers um, sort of loom over this report. They loom over much of what we're seeing in the global economy right now. What's your read on how real that uh, that boom is? There seems to be debate, debate out there whether this is um, something that's going to be sustained or a passing phase. What's your take? Uh, look, it's a very tough question. Um, just to link it into our own monetary policy report first. Uh, we did revise up our estimate of U.S. potential. Most of that actually is higher population growth. Um, there is some of it is productivity growth, but we have not taken on board a big permanent shift in to higher productivity growth. Um, to be honest, I think in all our countries, uh, the the gyrations we've seen in the economy through COVID have made have created big swings in productivity growth. When you when you shut down your uh, service sector, that's lower productivity than manufacturing. Mechanically, productivity goes up. I mean, what where the U.S. stands out is in, in Canada, like in most countries, uh, productivity growth coming out of the pandemic has been disappointing. We, we thought we would see more pickup as, as supply chains got back to normal, as you know, companies brought on board employees and got new employees and got them trained up. Um, so far, we, we really haven't seen that. Um, in the U.S., the, you know, productivity went up mechanically in the COVID like everywhere else, and it has stayed higher. Um, you know, there are certainly some things you can point to. Uh, you, know, you look at the stock market, the you know, large tech companies are doing very well. They tend to be very scalable, very high productivity companies. Uh, that might be one reason why U.S. productivity growth has been higher than others. Um, but I, I think at this point, it, it, it's hard to say just how persistent that rise in U.S. productivity growth will be. We have not built in a kind of a big productivity boom in the U.S. in our projection. Okay, we've got a couple more uh, questions here in the room. Um, next, I'm going to call on Paul Vieira of the Wall Street Journal, please. Was there any talk among officials about cutting rates today? Uh, Paul, we, look, we did discuss um, when to reduce our policy interest rate. Uh, there was a clear consensus to hold the policy rate at 5%. You know, as I've indicated, we were encouraged by the progress we've seen since January, and we agreed that what we wanted to see is we wanted to see this progress sustained. We wanted more time to be confident that this progress would be durable. We also agreed it would be appropriate to cut the policy interest rate when we're confident that we're clearly on a path to the 2% inflation target. Now, you know, as you might expect, we're a council of six different people, and so there's some diversity of there is some diversity of views about how close we are and you know you know when we're going to see what we're looking for uh, i would just say i think that's why you have a council uh you want some diversity of views that's healthy uh and and we're having a good discussion for the for the decision today there was a clear consensus to hold at five percent Okay, and I'm going to go. And you now. will be getting the summary of deliberations in a couple of weeks with. Well, we will expand. Sorry about that, Governor. Uh, we'll uh, go now to uh, Randy the Dong Knight from uh, Bloomberg, please. Um, how worried are you about uh, relatively weaker loony restoking inflationary pressures? Uh, look, you know, we have a flexible exchange rate in Canada that allows us to gear monetary policy to what's going on in Canada. Uh, and overall, the Canadian dollar's 
been really reasonably stable. Um, you know, if it if the Canadian dollar does move, that's something we'll take into account uh, in terms of our outlook. It will affect you know a weaker Canadian dollar will tend to make our exports more competitive. We'll tend to have more strength in, in exports. Um, there will be some uh, direct pass through uh, through imported goods. Those are things we take into account. But look, the the flexible exchange rate. Uh, it, 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 what, it's what allows us to run a monetary policy in Canada geared to uh, what we need in Canada. And we will, we will be, you know, we're gearing our monetary policy to where we think inflation's headed in Canada. Okay, uh, we're going to go to the reporters who have joined remotely now. I'll just remind you on the line to come off mute only to ask your question, and then please go back on mute as soon as you finish so that everybody can hear the response. I'm going to start with uh, John Ehrlichman from BNN Bloomberg and then go to Alicia Skirska from Yahoo and Max Sato of Mace News. So, John, uh, first question to you, please. Thanks so much. And Governor, uh, on commodity prices, uh, which we're watching very closely right now, can you just give us your current assessment on, on what you're going to be watching on the inflationary front from that perspective? Um, well, I guess a couple things on commodity prices. One, um, you have to look at commodity prices through two lenses. Uh, certainly, Global oil prices have a very direct impact on uh, things like gasoline prices, and, and that has a very direct and immediate impact on total CPI inflation. You know, gas prices you know, tend to go up and down, so that's one reason why we're particularly focused on core inflation. Um, and you know, we're... You know, if you look at the near term, we we know gasoline prices have gone up. That's why we think uh, total CPI inflation is likely to stay around three percent in in the uh, in in uh, months ahead. Um, what we're going to be particularly focused on is core inflation. We do think there will be further gradual easing in core inflation, and when we talk about uh, the progress we've seen recently being sustained, that's what we mean. Uh, or certainly that's an important element of, of what we're looking for. Um, the other element of commodity prices, of course, is Canada is an important commodity producer. We export a lot of commodities to the world. So the higher commodity prices, the more income tends to come into Canada. So it also affects demand. So we'll, you know, we're looking at, at both, both those dimensions. Okay, the next question is Alicia uh, Sikirska from uh, Yahoo Finance, please. Thanks, Governor, for taking our questions. Um, given that there will be a new federal budget uh, before the next rate decision, we've already seen some new spending 